Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is July 7, 2021. And in this video, I'm going to give some tips for how to start a socialist YouTube channel doing audiobooks like this one. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So before I get into the commentary, if you hear a little bit more hiss or noise in the background than usual, it's an air conditioner, it's summer and it's hot. Okay, so recently I got a question over Twitter that said, Hello, I've listened to your audiobooks for some time now. Great work. Over the years, there have been plans and ideas in my organization to make communist audiobooks in a language other than English. We have a pretty good idea what to do and how, but we figured we should ask people like you with experience for tips, how you do it, pitfalls to avoid, and things like that. Thanks in advance. Sincerely yours, etc. Okay, so first of all, I'd really like to thank this person for that comment because it really got me thinking. Um, so assuming that you want to do a channel like this one, uh, first of all, great. Um, <laughs> second of all, you know, it may work out and it may not work out, but no matter what happens with the channel, remember, first of all, that it's good experience and you're going to learn something from it and other people are going to learn something from it too. So I have assembled the following 10 tips and I will talk about each of them that can serve as a basis, a kind of outline or skeleton for talking about some of the things that I have learned in the roughly year and a half that I've been doing this channel. Of course, before I did Socialism for All, I've been involved with other kinds of activist groups. I ran S4A as a Facebook group for a longer than that. So, you know, it's more than just the experience of the last year and a half, although that's what I'll be focusing on. I'd also like to mention that the last video I put up on the channel prior to this one is a reply to Bad Mouse Productions, why I dropped off the face of the earth or something to that effect. If you would like more advice on what to do and what not to do, in my opinion, listen to that video as well. I think this one is more of the positive what to do and that video is more of a negative what not to do. Uh, although I think that there will probably be crossover between them. So you can check both of those out if this topic interests you. So my first piece of advice is the two-year rule. What is that? This is actually something credit to Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk. I'm not a huge fan of his channel, but I heard him say this once. I thought it was good advice, really, for starting any project like this. So basically, the two-year rule is expect nothing significant to happen for your channel or website or whatever you're doing for the first two years. If you can live with putting in tons of effort and doing a lot of promotion for two years without really much in the way of rewards or very modest rewards, then you have what it takes to get started. If you want instant success and you don't think that you could suffer through the first two years if they're difficult, this may not be for you. And you may want to work in more of a support capacity for another channel that might be looking for writers or researchers or something like that. But if you are touched in this special kind of way that people who make channels are, then uh, probably you fit into this category of people who can tolerate a uh, difficult first two years. So the second tip is know your scene. So know your scene before you enter it. You're probably already familiar somewhat with the existing scene associated with the Marxist subculture in your area and in your language, but you want to make sure that you become as familiar with it as possible while you are planning your entry into it. You want to know what's already there and you want to know how you may be received, how you stand in relation to all the other things on the landscape. So you want to do kind of a study of that. Subscribe to other channels, become aware of the kind of content that they are putting out. So like, for example, before somebody writes a book or does a research study, they usually check out like the top five most popular existing books on their topic so they can see what's already been done. What are the major schools of thought? What are the major styles of approach to the subject that are in the popular domain currently? 
or with a research paper, you want to see what's already been published, what is there a need for, what isn't there a need for, and you can kind of find your niche and line that up with what you actually want to do. Having positive and negative role models of what kind of channel you want to have and what kind of channel you don't want to have and why. Why do you or why don't you want to do that thing or this thing? That's important. Try to make a social map, at least in your head, of the different major and more minor players on that landscape. So again, you can be aware of what your position is going to be starting out. And as you find your own place, because you're creating something, it's not there currently, you're going to be putting something out there, like planting a seed, and it's going to interact with other people, it's going to interact with viewers, it's going to interact with other channels, etc. If you're on YouTube, uh, this can also show you what other channels your audience is uh, watching the most. If you go to the analytics tab, and that can give you some idea of where your listeners or viewers are coming from and what kind of ideas and discourse is already on their minds. So you should make use of that information. The more self-aware that you are of how other people are taking your channel and again, where you stand in relation to other existing things that have already been created and built, um, the more intelligently you'll be able to make decisions about your channel and your relationship with your audience and relationship with other creators, etc. So the next point is figure out what you want to do. Make kind of a plan right on this subject for a while until your mind is empty. You know, you want to get all your thoughts out, develop them. What do you want to do? Do you want to do mostly audiobooks? Do you want to do some current events? Uh, what is it that you want to do? What needs are not being met currently? Again, this is coming off a of point too, but it's also, I would say, plan out what do you want to do for your first 10 or 20 videos? Like have an ideas list. Uh, you know, at any given time, I have probably a hundred or more ideas of possible videos. Every time that an idea occurs to you that, oh, that could be a good video, uh, make a folder in your computer for it. Um, write it down somewhere, whatever you do, but keep, keep it in a list and review the list often. You know, um, if you want to space out and stare at your list for a while, you can get ideas. And I'll tell you that some of the things turn into multi-part videos, while others never really turn into a video, but they might be like a thought that you mention in passing more than once in other videos. But keep track of your ideas. You don't want to lose them. Um, the filmmaker David Lynch speaks on creativity and catching ideas a lot. You might check out a couple of interviews with him. Uh, interesting stuff about creativity. But basically, once you've caught an idea, you don't want to lose it. You don't want to forget it. So just write it down. You may never use it, or you might use it three years later, and it might have slightly changed form. But, you know, get your video ideas and then start to order them, you know, start to figure out, is there some kind of logical like flow in the ideas? What do you want to do first? What would be a good follow up to that? Uh, you know, how long will it take to produce this particular idea or whatever? So have your ideas list and then map out, you know, what do you want to do for the first few months? You probably don't want to be going totally by the seat of your pants the entire way, just like hand to mouth idea wise. You're gonna probably build up a lot of ideas and your audience, as you build one, will suggest ideas. You don't have to do every one, we'll talk about that later. But keep them on a list and refer back to it often. And that way, you will be able to flesh out and develop your own thought. And then when people ask you questions, you'll you know, be at different levels of completeness on the different trains of thought that you have going. And hey, now you have a channel that's an outlet for talking to the world about them. So that's point three. So point four, now that you have made your commitment to doing this for two years, or at least a year, let's say, and you have figured out 
the scene that you're trying to enter and who your audience might be. And you have got a bank of ideas ready to go that you're doing reading on and assembling material in support of. It's time to get your talent and your gear. So figure out, you know, your medium. Who's going to be doing it? Are you going to be on camera? Are you not? Are you going to use your real name? I would recommend against that, particularly in the beginning, because if you don't want to stick with this, you don't necessarily want your legal name attached to it. Use a stage name, use a pen name. Artists have been doing this for a very long time, as well as in a revolutionary context. Uh, you know, false names have been part of the, the secret aspect of, of what it is that we do, because this is uh, not met with great approval by uh, the authorities in society. So anyway, on the talent side, you know, figure out who is going to be on camera. If somebody's going to be on camera, you probably want them to be photogenic, uh, have some charisma, etc. If they're just going to be on audio, try to find somebody with a good radio voice and record them using good microphones and equipment. You know, if you're doing audiobooks, some of them can be really long, like five to seven hours. Uh, if you have somebody with uh, not a good voice or they don't have good expression in their voice and it's recorded on a bad mic, nobody's really going to want to listen to that. Or it's going to be harder to get people to listen to it. Let's put it that way. People might be interested in your content, but they might find it grating. So um, on a technical note, I'll give you my setup. I use a Shure SM57 microphone. This is a standard studio mic. Uh, and then I use a little bit, once it's in the computer, of digital equalizing, compression, and room reverb. Uh, I use Kakos Reaper software to do the recording. Um, if you can find somebody who knows how to do this, it's going to make your video sound better in the end. So, yeah. You want to treat the recording just like filming a movie or a TV show. If you get a bad take of a particular line, or you emphasize the wrong part of a sentence, or you mispronounce a word, don't keep going. Most of the time, you should stop and re-record that line. It gets annoying, but I almost always, if I think I've mispronounced something, I stop, I look up the word, I find it out. You're making something which maybe thousands of people might be listening to over the next five years or longer. So make sure that it's performed or recorded as well as you practically can do it. So the next point, point number five, is about the audiobooks themselves. Enhance your audiobooks and also think of audiobook as interview. So on my channel, this is at least my style, you might not want to follow this, but I usually don't just do the audiobook straight through. I often, uh, if it really jogs something vivid for me, I will stop and comment where it's appropriate. My better teachers in high school and college emphasized that reading is an active process and that you should read with a pen in your hand and make notes in the margins, always, as the material makes you think. It's a two-way street. It's not passive. I do the same thing when I read aloud for the microphone. And um, nine times out of ten, people appreciate this. Every once in a while, I get some asshole who's like, well, I just got a comment the other day. What are you, a historian? Just shut up and read. Well, <laughs> let's just say uh, I'm not running the channel for people who think that. And uh, that comment didn't live for long. And uh, that commenter won't be commenting again. You know, if you don't want annotated audiobooks, go somewhere else. That's why I put, usually, if it'll fit, YouTube gives you 100 characters in the title. I usually put audiobook plus discussion. If you don't want the discussion, go to another channel. But, you know, I've gotten other feedback from people that say, you know, when I listen to the LibriVox or whatever, you know, my eyes glaze over and I kind of space out. I like the way that you do it because it's more engaging. Well, good. That's what I'm doing this for. Again, if you want non-annotated, there's definitely non-annotated versions out there. So anyway, 
I do what I do and whatever. We'll uh, we'll come back to fuck the haters a little bit later on. But fucking the haters is a big part of running a YouTube channel. All right. So continuing on, enhance your audiobooks and audiobook as interview. So, yeah, um, I do the same thing when I read aloud for the microphone, marking up the text where it makes sense. Define unusual terms for your audience so that they can follow along. Some of the best advice I ever got was from my 11th grade English teacher who said, whenever you read, keep a dictionary next to you. And as soon as you encounter a word you're unfamiliar with, look it up. It's the best way to expand your vocabulary. And also that way you're actually following along and not merely guessing at the meaning of what you're reading. That's important, critical, really. So you wanna help your audience with that. Um, we're trying to agitate, educate, and organize. Organizing is probably beyond the scope of a YouTube channel. We can at least agitate and educate. And so, you know, some of these things were written a long time ago and possibly, you know, written at a high level. Help your audience to digest the information. That's, you know, if you can do that well for people, that will be part of why they come back to your channel over other channels. Not that it's a competition necessarily, but people will value that is, is really just the point I'm trying to make. People will gravitate towards whatever helps them to digest that material and actually use it and learn it the best. So, you know, think of it like teaching in front of a classroom because that's basically what you're doing just virtually. Anything that gets you excited in the text as you're reading it may also get your listeners excited. So pause for a minute, talk about it, why it's important, or other interesting topics that it ties into you. If you disagree with something or find it funny, stop and mention that, taking some, you know, explain why. You know, take a moment to point out what's interesting about that and why you think that. And people may go, oh, I never thought of it that way. Modeling that kind of critical engagement with the material for the audience may help them to stay interested in the audiobook, keep listening to the end, and may encourage them to think about it more deeply rather than just trying to passively absorb it by osmosis. So along these lines, I considered making this a separate point. I think it's fine here. You can almost think of the text as an interview or like you're having a guest on your channel. So there you are reading the words of a famous revolutionary or philosopher or politician in real time, as if they were on your channel talking, you're just, you know, reading their words. What is your reaction? You know, if, if they were a guest on your show saying the things that you're, you know, reading, saying the words that, that they said or wrote in a book or something, what would your reaction be? What would you ask them about what they're saying? Put those thoughts out there to your audience. You can either do it as you go, as I tend to do, or you can make a separate video to discuss the reading. But I would say do it. You know, it's as close to interviewing a lot of these people as you can get. <laughs> Many of them are not alive anymore. And I think that that helps to make the listener think of themselves in the driver's seat. So like not seeing this discussion of socialism as a passive activity or like dead history but something which they're involved with personally. That's the perspective we want if we're trying to build class consciousness, getting people to think about these ideas in context, in their own historical perspective, and in their daily lives. So point six, uh, this is also related to doing the audiobooks, but more about current events. So you may not want your whole channel to be audiobooks. Um, you know, I found that varying it, uh, I have gone pretty heavy on the audiobooks because there is a need for people to know more theory and history. And part of the desire to start the channel for me was I wanted to read more theory and history. I had considered pursuing a doctoral program to do some of this. And for a number of reasons, that didn't come together. Then I was like, why don't I just read these into the microphone? Then I can, uh, you know, study them and share them with the world. And here we are a year and a half later. So when you do current events, uh, I suggest that you try to tie in the lessons and concepts from the audiobooks that you've covered. So that way you're building momentum 
and coherence to everything that you've covered on the channel. You tie it back in together and building those connections in your audience's mind, that's important. It's going to strengthen the understanding. People study theory and history because they want to be more able to understand the present and predict the future. They want to eliminate confusion and gain clarity. So when you show your audience this process in action, it builds their confidence in the material and their respect and loyalty for the movement which you're a part of. So, you know, you're actually helping them solve a problem in their life. You're helping them to understand uh, things better. All right, so the next point is promote, promote, promote. So at this point, you have some content on your channel, all right? Maybe you have 10 subscribers, maybe you have 20 subscribers, whatever it is. You've done some audiobooks, you've done some interviews, whatever you've done, you've got some content. Now you've got to get it in front of people's faces. So issue one, the YouTube search function is broken. It is non-existent. Anytime that you search on something starting, I think, about 2019, YouTube uh, instituted this policy of favoring, quote, authoritative news. Their version of authoritative news includes the Fox News Network. So that just goes to show, you know, how much quality is involved in that. But anyway, there were significant changes to the way that YouTube's returns search results starting in 2019. Anything underground, forget it. You can't find it anymore. So how do you get this content in front of people's eyeballs? Basically, independent promotion. Uh, start a Twitter, make friends with people, go on Reddit, post some of your links where appropriate, don't spam them. Go on Facebook, go on whatever social media works and spread your content. Focus on things that get your posts into you know, as many people's feeds with as little effort as possible. I personally love or did love the Facebook groups because with a click, you could send your content by sharing it into a group with 10,000 people who have already joined a group with socialism in the title. Uh, that was a key part of growing S4A in the days when uh, before I got uh, kicked off of Facebook for like the third time. I may still like get a burner phone and get back on Facebook, but for right now, I'm just uh, relying on the kindness of supporters to share it there for me. But the point is you've got to get your stuff out there. Uh, do not wait for, you know, the wind to pick it up. You got to like launch it yourself. Uh, do guest spots on other people's channels. Have people onto your channel, although understand if your channel's super tiny, people may not want to come on. And if they do, you know, do thank them profusely because they are taking the time to help your channel out. Just understand that. Beyond that, if you just search on like how to do online marketing, you'll get tons of lists, you know, 25 different ways to promote your stuff. Um, try them, see what works for you personally. And in that process, you know, plant your seeds in different soils and uh, some of them will grow and some of them won't. And boom, you're finding your audience. But Definitely promote your work. Um, don't assume, particularly in the beginning, that anyone's going to do it for you. All right, so that's point seven. Point eight is money. Figure out your relationship or your project's relationship with money early on. I would say, when in doubt, keep money out. Yeah, it rhymes. If you want to do a tip jar of some kind, whether it's Patreon or some of the other alternatives to Patreon that have popped up, uh, you know, drop your link. See if anybody drops you a few bucks. But I would definitely say money does change things. Avoid the sponsorships. Avoid all that crap. Do it again. Go back to the two-year rule. I mean, remember why you're doing this thing. If you're doing it for money, please stop listening now. That's not a good reason for this. We don't need people in a political movement 
for fucking socialism, interested in money, get out. If you're even considering that, fuck you. We don't want you in this movement. So as far as running ads and shit like that, again, you know, it's one thing if you're running a tip jar, people donate you a little money. It's another to run ads on your stuff. Uh, that tends to help on the, you know, in the case of YouTube, it helps Google a lot more than it helps you. And, you know, do you really want to subject your audience to that? I mean, probably a lot of them have ad blockers, but really, I would say, you know, keep those commercial relationships really as close to non-existent and usually just simply non-existent as you can. Although if you do want to give your audience ways to donate to you, that can increase audience participation and cohesion. And people who really want to support you are usually happy to be able to do that. You know, doing merch or something like that. I haven't ventured into merch, but, uh, you know, again, you're making more money probably for somebody else by getting merch unless you're like hand doing it yourself at home. Um, but, you know, I guess it can be fun. But focus on the content, not the money. When in doubt, keep money out. All right, so I hope that's clear. Any questions, ask me in the comments. So point nine, um, your channel's up and running. You got a couple of hundred viewers now. Your promotion schemes, you've found a few things that work to attract people to your channel. What's next? Well, a couple of points I would lump together. Know your limits, stick to it, set goals, and celebrate your wins. So, know your limits. Um, what do I mean? Basically, refer back to the beginning. Why are you doing the channel? Draw on that passion. And um, you can try new things occasionally, but mainly know your limits of what you're interested in, what your strengths are, and stick to what you can do well. You know, try new things sometimes as you get new ideas, but you don't want to be constantly reinventing yourself. Put the most energy into what's working best, and you'll minimize your mistakes while maximizing your success and positive impact. And, you know, even if you're not putting a huge effort into, like, reinventing your channel, there will be a progression and there will be a growth as the ideas coalesce and build on each other your channel will take a direction on its own. You like don't have to plan that. I mean, I would try in general to have a few things in the bullpen, you know, uh, that are possible next videos to make or plot out like a few mini series for your channel or something like that. But know that it's going to take on kind of a, a life of its own and you'll be partly directing, but also partly writing that movement. So, um, you know, thinking back to entering the scene and knowing the landscape, remember that you're not the only person out there with a channel. Others will see what you're doing. They will also fill the holes in the movement for you so you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, you know, even if you feel like your channel is limited, you know, that gives other people space to do things and they will. They will. Uh, even if it looks like nothing's happening right now, Someone you maybe have never heard of might be planning to launch something great tomorrow. Or maybe they've already launched it and you just haven't heard of it yet. So, you know, again, stick to what you can do well. And um, that will inspire other people to do what they can do well. And then over time, you get a diversified scene, which is meeting a lot of needs. At some point, we may reach a point where we have more organization in the movement, uh, planning content, but this is the way that it is right now. So, um, also, you know, on the note of topics and ideas, people who get into your channel might start asking you to do all kinds of things that they're interested in, but don't be afraid to politely say no if it doesn't line up with your strengths or the direction that you feel that things are or should be growing in. The community is going to give you many good ideas. Having fans is great, but they'll also give you some suggestions which you can't or don't want to do. But don't worry about that. Be responsive to your audience where 
their suggestions line up with your ideas and interests, I can definitely tell you that some of the best stuff I've done has been suggested by the audience, you know, and I kind of worked it into what I was already interested in and I gave it my own spin. Um, but, you know, also be realistic with your audience and the ones who appreciate you are going to stick with you whether or not you do exactly what they tell you, um, you know, have a healthy relationship with your audience. A couple of other technical points here. Uh, publish often. It doesn't need to be scheduled, but the more often you can post, um, YouTube likes that and, you know, it'll tend to favor you in the algorithm if you post frequently. Um, but, you know, again, be realistic, do what you can do, but just try to stick to it once you, you know, have gotten something going. Uh, you have a relationship with your audience. That is two way. And um, the more that they know kind of generally what to expect from you in terms of frequency and things like that, uh, you know, that becomes more of a regular thing that they understand and trust and know you know, what they're getting and they're able to make sense of what you're doing, basically. You know, it's not just some random thing that's changing all the time. Also, um, this is another point that can be good for audience building. You know, stick to what's interesting to you and your audience where that overlaps. But once in a while, you may want to branch out and cover a popular topic that can help you expand your base. Um, for example, I do critiques sometimes of other channels like Jimmy Dore or Kim Iverson or Kyle Kalinske. And um, that can bring in a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have seen your channel otherwise. You know, it's kind of like if you're in a music group and you do a cover song, it can, you know, bring in a lot of people who might not have listened to you otherwise. Uh, so, for example, when I did my first response video to Vosh, who is like everything wrong with the U.S. left rolled into one person. I think I got 700 new subscribers in half a week after I did a point by point criticism of his, you know, Mao and Lenin want you to vote for Joe Biden thing that he did before the election last fall. Don't make it your whole channel, but doing that once in a while, one or two a month, uh, you know, assuming you're making, you know, a dozen or 15 videos a month, you know, if you make it about five or 10 percent of your content it can definitely uh, help to bring in new audience members and build that subscriber count and uh, build momentum for your channel. The last thing I'll say here, just on a motivational note, set goals for yourself and celebrate your wins when you reach the goals. So for example, um, you're gonna start out with zero subscribers. At some point you hit 100 subscribers. By hook or by crook, you're gonna do it. And then YouTube lets you name your channel. They give you a custom URL. Celebrate that. You know, do something nice for yourself when you reach that mark. Then, you know, going back to the earlier point about finding positive and negative role models of other channels. Um, find other channels that are doing the kind of thing you want to do and note what their subscriber counts are and kind of like rank them. <laughs> as far as like, someday I'm gonna be as big as X. Someday I'm gonna be as big as Y. Someday, although I can't imagine it currently, I hope I'm as big as Z. And then, you know, track your progress. Um, for me, you know, hitting 2,700 was a big deal. That was, for me, uh, about as far as I have planned. <laughs> My next goal is around 10 or 12,000. Uh, and it's gonna be a lot of work getting there. But it was kind of like, you know, 25 or 3,000 was my first major, major goal. You know, and then it's probably 10 or 12, and then probably 50, and then like 100 or 80. So yeah, set your goals and um, celebrate your wins. It's important to keep yourself motivated. And then if you're not reaching your goals, take some time to figure out why. Um, it might be that the audience isn't ready for what you're doing. Could be that you're not very good at it. <laughs> like whatever it is, try to be honest with yourself. And by actually rigorously critiquing yourself, 
you know, uh, I think sometimes people think when I do these critique videos of other channels, it's like I'm not critiquing myself. It, not true. Uh, people who are successful tend to self-criticize well. So, yeah, if you can self-criticize well, uh, when things stick, you can probably get them unstuck pretty quickly because you'll already have kind of a handle on what is or what isn't working for you. And if you're confused, ask your audience. You know, your supporters will want to help you. So actually, that is a nice segue into point 10. Thank the supporters and fuck the haters. So starting with the haters, no matter what you do, these people will exist. Some of them will be cops. And because of the anonymous nature of YouTube, you can't tell who's a cop and who isn't. But people who are just detracting from what you're doing, you should not listen to them and you should not engage with them at all. Uh, personally, I just delete them as quickly as possible before they can have an effect on anyone else. Before they can, uh, you know, some people say, oh, well, you know, I just let people post whatever. And then, you know, the other commenters will take care of it. Well, A, you're giving that person, whether they're a cop or just an asshole, you're giving them a platform they wouldn't have otherwise. Don't do that. I think it's actively bad to do that. Second of all, you don't want to subject your audience to that. I, I mean, you know, it's work that they have to do. Um, keep the space clear. You know, again, teacher in a classroom or host of a speaking event. You're going to want to facilitate it. And people who are there to wreck should not be allowed to do that. So note here that I said haters, not critics. We were just talking about criticism. Most of the people tuning into your stuff are going to be there to learn out of genuine interest. You want to help them do that. Um, if these people give you constructive criticism, like turn the volume up on your mic or something like that, you should listen to that because they're telling you whatever it is they're telling you because they like you and they want to enjoy your content more fully and you can learn from that constructive criticism to make your content better. But again, like I said, people who come to make destructive comments or slam you or just whine about their own opinions that don't really contribute to you know, the conversation really are doing nothing to help either you or your audience. So block them or kick them out or whatever. This is like... I think there's like a strange amount of taboo on doing this. Uh, even in, you know, socialist YouTube, for some reason, people seem very squeamish about this. But um, given the amount of fucking trolls out there, and it's an insane amount, as well as like flat out cops, I don't get the squeamishness. We're trying to do our thing. Protect that thing. Protect the people who show up protect yourself. Don't let that negativity spread. You know, your videos come with a comment section. That doesn't mean you just have to let everybody write whatever fucking garbage they want to write. You don't. You don't owe your commenters anything if they're not there to learn. While you may be doing these audiobooks for the movement and community, ultimately it is your channel. And you need to run it in such a way that you can keep doing it on a sustained basis and for the benefit of everyone who is sincerely trying to engage with it. So when doing that, you know, no, it's not going to be a majority of your activity, particularly once you have blocked, you know, in a few waves, uh, that would be the most dedicated trolls who make kind of a living out of doing this stuff. Know that there will always be many more people who are interested in participating constructively than there will be trolls and cops. So, again, disregard them without worry or concern or shame. Uh, they weren't going to really help you at all. Anyway, new and better people will always be coming along. They will be your support base. People often think that they're completely entitled to clog up your comments with their own opinions even if no one else agrees with them, 
even if they're not supported by reality, etc. But usually the people who are most likely to think this are the ones least likely to be supportive in any helpful way to you and your community, and they should be dealt with as soon as they become a hindrance for you or for other members of your learning community who may be shy and they might get scared off by aggressive people in the comments and they may not want to comment for fear that somebody is going to be aggressive and antagonistic to them. There's plenty of people on the edge of a nervous breakdown in this stressful, alienating world that we live in. And, you know, you can help people to feel more comfortable to post in the comments by not letting things devolve into gang warfare for any reason. Don't let that happen. Putting in all this effort for free isn't exactly easy in the first place. And let, you know, all the more so it gets more difficult when people are taking shots at you. So if it's not actually constructive, keep it safe for everyone, including yourself. And I'm mentioning a lot about this point because when you do political things in particular, like advocate for the end of capitalism, it does really tend to attract a lot of trolls and weirdos. And, um, you know, if you're at a point where you're still kind of learning about all the weirdos that are out there, I mean, you know, run your own experiments if you want to question them. You know, sometimes somebody may come off really strangely, but they may actually be sincere and you're misunderstanding them. But, you know, bottom line is like, don't waste too much energy on it. You have videos to make. Anyway, I think that that's about it. Um, this video is about as long as the Bad Mouse video, so you get roughly equal, uh, you know, two video set there on what not to do and what to do, again, with some overlap. I hope that this has been helpful. I'm happy to answer some other reasonable questions in the comments about all this. Um, otherwise, I will be on a little bit of a break again. Having that busy summer I talked about in a previous video. And uh, I am working on some long form audiobooks again. Expect that Origin of the Family by Engels, another long Lenin book, some Posadas, and so on. But it might not be up for like a week and a half. So thanks to the patrons, as usual, whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to support the channel on Patreon, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all can sign up for as little as two dollars a month and all of those donations are very encouraging so thank you all for doing that if donations are not your thing liking sharing subscribing and commenting is always helpful particularly into left facebook groups where we currently have no formal coverage by me i know some people are doing that and thank you for doing that but uh whatever it is you're doing to support this channel and the project of countering capitalist propaganda in general and turning more people on to the real alternative to capitalism that Marxism represents. Thank you for doing it, and we will catch you in the next video.